screen. All right. So we are off and running. Let's um, go away. Let's take a look at this. Okay. So um, first of all, there was uh, there were a few of you when you were turning in the homework on functions, which is, I don't know, chapter you know, I don't know, six or seven or eight or something like that. I can't remember exactly which chapter it is. Um, it's like chapter six. And uh, when you turned in your homework, you turned in the code to do the, to do the action that you wanted to do, but you didn't turn it in as a function. And I'm going, to I'm going to review that really quick so that you can uh, remember how to do that and turn it in properly. And any of the homework that I've graded or that I will be grading, if you review it and you um, want to fix it and, and return it in, you can. Um, it will, I, I believe it will allow you to turn it in late. You can go turn it in even though it's due, I believe. If that's not the case, send me an email. Is it you're saying it's not going to allow you to do that? Okay, so if it doesn't allow you to do that, then I will just open them up again really quick. But um, for the meantime, though, you can go back and look at the homework that I've given you and the feedback that I've written and, uh, and see what you need to change and ask questions or whatever else you'd like so that you can improve those, those grades. Um, I usually will not give all of the points back, but I usually will give a, a significant number of the points back for reviewed and changed homework so that you will, um, so that you will get a, a decent score. Now, um, let's see, why can't I, what am I saying here? I don't know what I'm saying there, that's okay, whatever. Okay, so let's go to MATLAB. And let's look at creating a function again, just really quick. When you're creating a function, you go up here to new and you open a function. Now you can do it this way, or you can just start from a new script and write the function yourself. Regardless of what you do, this is the form that your code should take in the script. It should start with the word function. That should be the very first line of code in your script when you're writing a function file. Then you have square brackets and inside the square brackets, you put your output arguments. Now, if you only have one output argument, you don't have to have the square brackets there. Um, so in other words, if, if you're outputting some kind, of, uh, some kind of variable with a name to it, then that's what you would put there. And then after that, that would be equal to the title of your function. So that's, that's right here is untitled. Now, if I type in a title here, it automatically gives this file the title. If you, if you uh, when, I, when I save it, so if I type in here my initials, Jed, or something like this, and then I go ahead and save this function, it's gonna say, save it as Jed.m. A function file should always be saved as the name of the function. And that's the name that you will use when you call the function in MATLAB. So if I go ahead and save it like that, it saves it as jed.m and it saves it as a function file over here in my current folder. And if I have, let's say that my output argument is going to equal uh, name or something like this, right? The input arguments should be whatever values have to be plugged into this. Now you don't have to have input, input arguments or output arguments, those can be blank on either end but you do need to start each function file with the word function so that it knows it's a function and you have to give it a name, right? So um, that's, that's how you start off a function. Then you put in whatever code that you're putting into the function. If the, if the function is requiring the user to input some kind of a number, then that should be included in your input argument. So maybe you're requiring them to input a letter or something and you want to call that thing letter. Let's say that I call it letter. And then I would use that down here in my code. Maybe I take whatever they put in and I put it into a, uh, a string or something, whatever. Um, whatever you're gonna do with it. And that's what you do down here. And then at the end of your function, it should have end. 
right? So if I go ahead and use one of the functions that has been created, all I have to do is go, all I have to do is drag that function from where where you input it in in my open math. I'll just download it and put it into my current folder. And then all I have to do is come down here and type Jed and whatever input you're asking for. If, if you're asking for a letter, then I, I put in, you know, J or something like this. Um, and let's, let's actually finish this function really quick. Let's say that um, display the first letter of your name, or let's just say, um, let's do an input actually. No, let's not even do that. Let's just say you, just do a display again. You typed in the letter. Uh, in fact, I actually want to do a, uh, this will work, letter like this, right? And then I can uh, just let that print to screen. I think that should work, Let's save that. So if I type this here, whoops, it didn't like that. Too many input arguments. No, it didn't like that. There's something about, uh, I need to convert that to, I need to uh, tell them that it's a string, right? Display you typed in the letter. Or I need to use fprintf or something like that. Let's use fprintf, doesn't matter. Whatever you're gonna put in your, um, um, Let's see. Oops. I'm not sure what the code needs to be here because I'm not because I'm just doing this on the fly. But regardless of what, there we go. And it actually gave me some weird thing here that I did weird, but it doesn't really matter. Oh, because it just needs to be. Uh, not string, but S, just S like that. There we go. So now I can do this. If I if I actually type in the code, if I if I say uh, Jed of J, so it calls this thing. It it saves J as letter, and then it and then it prints to the screen. You typed in the letter, whatever I put in for the letter for whatever I put in for letter, right? So it's. Um, that's a very simple and benign function does nothing really of interest. But that's the idea here is that your input arguments should show up down here. You could actually also suppress this and um, well, not, not necessarily suppress it, but you could, because the output is name, you could also uh, um, set this equal to name or something and use name somehow, whatever, because name is the output argument here. But regardless of that, we did, I don't know, maybe 10 different um, examples of that. So make sure that when you're entering in your home, your uh, assignments for, what was it, chapter six, and any other assignments that ask you to build a function, if it specifically says write a function, then I'm going to expect something like this, that I can just pull that file into my, into my current folder and then call it like a function in MATLAB like any other function, okay? So make sure that you type it in that way. And if you already did it that way, um, it, would be, it will be obvious from your grades in that, in that chapter, I think. Um, but if you didn't do it that way, there will be points taken off for each one that's not done that. So you can go in and fix those and we'll uh, regrade those. Um, do, do expect those regradings to take time uh, because um, I, and I have to figure out a way to know when the, when you've entered them in again. 
I know that there's a way to do that in mild math so that I know that you've re-entered them. But I think what, what should happen is that I think that the best thing to do is if you do go in and re, um, re-enter uh, files into an assignment, you should send me an email saying I re-entered files for homework seven, problems you know four, five, and six or something. And I will look at that email and I will go regrade those. Um, because otherwise, it's it's really a pain in the neck for me to go through and try to figure out who has who has done something. I know there's a way to do it, and or I think there's a way to do it in my open math. I've never done it before, but I think there is a way. But I don't think I have time to figure it out. And even if I did figure it out, there's no guarantee it would necessarily work the way I thought it would. I think it would, since I've never done it before. But anyway, um, so that's that's how it's going to go. If you would like to be regraded on any of your assignments. Um, go in and redo the code, resubmit the code, and I will open up the assignments so that you can do that. And then, um, and I'll actually do that right now. I'll reopen those assignments right now so I don't forget. But, um, then send me an email uh, telling me which, which assignment and which problems you have uh, re submitted. So these are for the programming assignments. And I'm going to change the dates essentially to uh, like May uh, 1st or something like that. So that you have a few weeks to, to kind of review those and take a look at them again. Three, chapter four, chapter five. And of course, the ones that I haven't done yet, because I think I'm in the middle of um, chapter seven or chapter eight, I think. Uh, so the ones that I haven't done yet, of course, uh, you don't need to go in and redo. You can if you want, if you think you've done something wrong. Ones that you just completely missed, because some people missed some assignments or forgot to enter in files, um, you can... You can re do those, but you still need to send me a letter or a, an email telling me to um, to regrade them because I, otherwise I just won't know. But I'm just going to put all those due dates on the 1st of May. You don't want to necessarily put off your homework to the 1st of May. That's uh, something you want to work on every week um, because programming a bunch of stuff all at once is just a pain in the neck. Trust me. I've done it plenty of times. I'm programming right now, in fact, which is not my favorite thing to do. Okay, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, talk about, I can't remember. We have uh, still chapter 14 and chapter 15 to, to finish up here. And I'm thinking that we'll be finished in the next, um, week or two so that we will still have a couple of weeks left at the end of the semester to do a project, which is good. Um, but we are starting on, we, we finished uh, section, we finished all the way through section 14.1, I believe, last time. We started talking about um, creating these Mandelbrot uh, fractals. And there are, there's a section later on where they talked about more fractals where you actually make a movie out of it because that's what we're going to be uh, covering today. So we're starting in section 14.2 now uh, with uh, graphics objects. So let's see, let's get to my MATLAB again here. All right, so um, it's really important sometimes in, in programming to be able to include objects outside of the code in your code. What does that mean? In your folder, you have these things, these files, these whatever you want to call them, M files, um, 
They could be images, whatever you have over here right now. Right here, I have a ping image. I have two ping images and, and two M files over here. One of the M files, a function M file. One of them's uh, just a just a script file. But there can be all kinds of things over here. There could be data files, all kinds of stuff. And these are all to MATLAB. These are all just things out there. They're just objects, uh, you know, to to be manipulated. They can be read into MATLAB. They can be um, turned into a matrix, whatever, but they're just things that MATLAB uses or can use to do things to or do things with. They're not code. They're not, um, they're not anything that is inherently a MATLAB recognized thing, but you can, you can turn them into things that MATLAB recognizes and MATLAB understands how to treat them. And this is when we start calling these things objects. And so when you create an object in MATLAB, it's, it becomes something that you can um, write into the code. You can make it part of the code and you can start to use, um, use some uh, MATLAB functions with it. And, and you can start to use um, some of the tools that make it easy to make them easier to manipulate within MATLAB. Uh, for example, when we when we created these inline functions and created function handles for inline functions, that was creating an object out of a function file, essentially. So so that you could use the dot notation we called it before, and it, it simplifies your code. It it makes it shorter, makes it faster. It's just very useful, and we can do this with graphical objects. We can do this with images. You can do it with videos. You can do it with animations. You can do it with all kinds of things. Excuse me. And, and that's what we're going to do. Now you can even do it with, with a set of axes. You can do it with all kinds of figure um, configurations. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna first create, uh, create an image. We're gonna create a plot actually. And then we're gonna do, use a plot. We're gonna create a plot handle for the plot. So. We're doing a, a plot similar to things that we've done before here. We're going to define a, a variable X. This will be our, you know, our horizontal um, coordinate numbers or whatever you want to call it, our function values or, or the values of our, um, of our domain. And we're going to do a linear, we're going to do linearly spaced numbers between negative 10 and 10 for this. So we're using the lin space command. And we'll just, that turns into a 100 element um, array there. And then we're going to go ahead and say, we're gonna define our uh, Y to be equal to the cosine of X. So that's another array of 100. And uh, we'll let H equal this plot of X and Y. Well, we didn't do this before necessarily. When we, when we did this before, we just said plot X and Y. Now we're actually saying H equals the plot of X and Y. So when MATLAB sees something like this, a command like this where, it's, where we're using a, a built-in uh, function that plots values against each other, creates an image, creates a, a figure window and puts axes in place and, and knows, you know, plot has a lot of code behind it. There's a lot of code behind the word plot in MATLAB. And instead of actually just running that code in MATLAB, we're going to take that code in MATLAB and we're gonna assign a value to, we're gonna assign it to a, a thing. We're assigning, assigning it to this thing called H right here. And so we go ahead and hit enter and you can see now that the plot has been plotted, right? And, but it also has put out this information. This gives us information about the properties of the plot H. It also created an object over here and an object is got this little box icon on it. And this thing essentially gives us, uh, if, let's see if it allows us to open it, should allow us to open it. Where did it go? Uh, I don't know why MATLAB died when I did that, but apparently it did. But it should just, it'll open up essentially a, a window with that information in it, it should anyway which it allows me to do it. 
Apparently Matt and I didn't like what I did, but that's okay. And we'll do it again. Maybe. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this again. We'll say X equals land space. Negative 10 and 10. We'll say Y equals cosine X. And we'll say H equals the plot of X and Y. Just like that. Okay, so now it's done it again. We'll go ahead and dock this puppy. So it's given us this, and let's see if it'll allow us to open up H as a object here. There it goes. So it's going to open up this thing we call a property inspector, which contains all of this information that is here, and even a little bit more here. The property inspector essentially gives you the data that's been stored or the properties that have been, doesn't actually give you, um, actually does give you the data. The data is right here. Gives you the information about the data anyway. But it gives you essentially all of the, all of the properties that MATLAB is using for this plot. And you could go in here into the property inspector and change them. So for example, right now, it's saying that we're using this line color blue, but if you click on this, you can actually click on a different color and choose, you know, this color here, whatever that is, magenta or something. And you go here to your figure and it has changed the color. And you could change the, um, the window appearance and you could change the position and you could change all kinds of things through here, through the property inspector. So um, objects, um, when, when you create an object, it actually creates this thing you know, this, this, it's an object that has the information about what you did with plot, essentially, what you did with what plot assigned to this particular, uh, this particular set of numbers that you put up there. Um, so you could actually, you could actually go ahead and throw a title on this title, call it whatever you want to call it, you know, trig whatever. And that's totally fine. It'll put a title on there. You could also label the axes, X label. And um, you could label X label and the X axis and the Y axis. I'm just going to do one. I'm not going to mess with them both, but um, it labels the axis just like you normally would. And then you can go back here to the property inspector. And you can start to look at um, other things here. Let's see if we can find. Uh, data. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to remember where they put this in here. It's in here somewhere. I just don't seem to be finding it. Oh. You used to actually be able to change the name on the axis, but I can't see where that is now. Keyboard window appearance. Position. Plotting. Printing. There's a lot of stuff here. Well, identifiers. I don't know this, but anyway. Um, but as you're doing things to your plot here, and, and actually you may have to, that actually may have to be done differently to include that in here. Um, but you can do this, this thing normally like we did before, but there are also other ways to put this in. And I think that's 
actually going to, let's see. I think there's another way, yeah, there is another way to do this. So yeah, so let's, uh, let's just keep going. We'll show how that goes. So um, one, of the, one of the other ways that you can grab this, grab information here is to, to use a, uh, a built-in function MATLAB called get. And uh, if you do get H, it actually will give you all that information from that, from those property, from that property inspector. It doesn't actually give you the property inspector, but you can actually call the property inspector um, uh, you might be able to do it just no I can't remember how to do that but you can call it from the window um, it would probably show us that eventually but you can also change properties in, uh, in the property inspector directly from here using code and this is where it becomes very important and very useful so we're about halfway down 574. We use the set command and we're gonna actually set some values that are in the property inspector or in the properties of this thing. So we're gonna use, we're gonna be setting properties in H and we're gonna set the color property. So the color property is with a capital C, it is a string, so we have to put it in there. And we're gonna change the color property to the string called red, like this and it changes it to red. Now there's another way to do this. You can also use the dot, the, the dot notation, which uses the handle, for the, the handle for this plot. The handle for this plot is H. It's actually why they called it H. So the dot uh, command format is you do H dot, and then you do color. So that's one of the properties, and then equals, and then red. And we can change that to blue, for example. All right. So that is that is the beginning of, of of the understanding of this handle idea. Now, why why would that be useful? Because that can be written into code. You could write it into a for loop, for example, and you could change the color every time you go through the for loop or a while loop. You could write it into all kinds of things and start to manipulate it like you would just a variable. You know, the, the plot now becomes just a value that MATLAB knows, and it has not just one value, but a lot of values in it. All the things that are in the properties become parts of this object that you can manipulate in the code. So it can be quite useful. For example, there's, there's an example of this in the code I'm writing right now, actually. I'm using um, image handles and, and video handles because I'm taking a video that's uh, an hour long or so. And the video has 30 frames per second, or is it 60 frames per second? I don't know. It's got a lot of frames per second. I need to extract a picture from this video every second or so. And then the picture I need to take quadrants of, I need to take little, I need to crop out little pieces from it so that I get a bunch of smaller pictures. And then I need to turn each one of those pictures into a black and white picture or start by turning it into a black and white picture before I start or not black and white, but grayscale actually. And then I need to, I need to pixelize it, which means I take a bunch of pixels and average them together and then replace all those pixels with one big pixel that's the average of all of them. So in the end, it takes the, it takes the image and it kind of blurs it, right? And then I need to take each of those images and name them and give them an, a, a name. And that's, this is where this, so inside I'm doing a loop, I'm using a while loop to do this. So while the video is running, while I'm running through the video and there's still video left to do this, I'm going every 30 frames, which is about every second, and I'm grabbing the picture out. I'm reading out the, the, the file that is that, that, picture, that image file. And I'm going through and doing all these things to this image. And as I'm doing to it, doing these things to it, I'm using the image handles to, to talk about what I want to do, what I want to change, how I want to manipulate it. 
Um, it's, and it's just much more concise code. It's much faster code in, in MATLAB. And I'm gonna, I, for an hour long, for an hour long video at you know 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second or whatever it is, that's a lot of images. That's a lot of images, thousands of images in the end because of each for each second, I have one image that I split into six, right? Um, and you know, there's a lot of seconds in an hour. So 3,600 to be precise. So I'm gonna get you know, 12,000 images or something. Um, and I have several videos as well, not just the one. So I'm trying to write a, a single piece of code, one, one, uh, one kind of program that I can just plug in the video to it and it just does it automatically and dumps it out. And I did this, I did this a year ago or so, um, not for a video, but for a, just a group of images where I had to manipulate the images a whole bunch. And I didn't use the function, uh, the, fun, the, the uh, handle, um, figure handles and it was it was a little bit messy it was a little bit cumbersome I have to say and quite slow <laughs> took a lot of time so anyway uh, this is the idea of uh, using these these handles well this dot notation with uh, and assigning this this figure a uh, into to an object essentially so this is a plot handle you can do the same thing with figure handles uh, you can do the same thing with figures or, or however you want to call them. And, you know, fig, you know, what's the difference between a plot and a figure and a, and a graph and an image and all these things? There's really not that much difference um, when it comes down to the nitty gritty. But, um, but still, we'll learn how to do this with different, in different situations. So <clears throat> a figure handle is actually, instead of um, including the the figure window and everything that you've plotted in it like the plot handle did the figure window is going to do the same thing except just for the figure window so it's gonna it's going to assign we're essentially assigning a value or a, an object to a figure window in a configuration and then we can have a configuration that we can modify in our code as well so if you want if you're doing a, if you're if you're looking at a bunch of images and you want the figure window to, to remain the same for every image, no matter what the image does, if it's a bigger image, smaller image, you know, different aspect ratios or whatever else, then this is, a, this is actually a good, uh, good thing to do and it has a lot of other uses as well. Let's go and see what they're doing here. This is on page 575. Um, so right now, my figure window is, is this figure one figure window. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, call f, f underscore handle. So I'm just assigning it the name f handle. And I'm going to let that equal, equal figure one. Figure one is this thing here, this, this window holding this figure. So figure one. So um, these are the properties of the figure window right now that we've got here. And that's yeah, pretty similar to the one that they have. Not exactly the same, but pretty similar. Difference in, there's a difference in the position uh, properties. That's okay. Um, and then I can actually change the properties of the, the figure window, just like I will in very similar ways that I did for the, um, for the plot window. So I'm gonna say my F underscore handle, which is my figure window handle. And I'm gonna do a dot and we're going to, let's see, what's the first thing they do? They do a color again, color equals. Now they're doing something a little bit different here. Let's see what this does for us. And point 0 0.4, um, 0 0.4. Comma, zero point four comma. Oh, that's it. Just three of them. Right. What they've done is they've actually changed the shading around the plot because the the figure window is the thing that's around the plot. So they've changed that shading to a, a 
to a different shade. It was set at uh, 0.94 apparently, now it's 0.4. You could also do that using the set command that we used in the previous section. You can also change the name so we could F handle name and call it whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. and, in, and here it gives it a title up next to figure one. It's mine, right? Now you can, you can get the information of the current figure we use get and then you use C, uh, GCF for current, uh, get current figure, I guess. And this gives you all of the different properties for this figure window. Now, why would you care about doing something like that? Well, this is, this is more useful when you're writing a program that is going to interact with the user, um, you're, you're going to be asking the user for information. They're going to be inputting things. You're going to be outputting things. It's more of a more of a um, uh, user interface kind of thing, so that you can change the, the the visual appearance of outputs to the screen. And you can do this with just about anything MATLAB prints to the screen. Uh, there are many, many types of objects that MATLAB can display on the screen, including the little, the, like the push button um, selector windows that pop up and all kinds of things like that. Not just things that are here in our MATLAB window. So you can do the same thing for axes. There, you can create a handle for your axes so that you and, and when you create these handles, what you're really doing is you're, you're creating kind of a saved formatting for these things so that you can go back and say, oh, well, I want to, we're going to use this formatting to, for all of this stuff that I'm going to do. But then inside, you want to change all of the stuff that you did, all of the figures you did. You want to change some property about all those figures or all those plots. Well, you can change it in one place and it changes it for all the places that you use that handle to plot figures or to create figure windows or whatever. And you can do the same thing with axes. You can have all of your axes be the same and then you can change them all together. You can have them change all at once. And that's a huge deal. And you can have the code change them. So depending on what happens in the code can determine what happens to your axis, to your axes, or what happens to your figure window or what happens to your plot window, your, your plot um, image. And so this is why these are useful. Here they go through all the different ways that you can change uh, the axes. You can change um, how the axis is separated. So on the, in this axis, you have one tick, which is one of these little things here, every two integers, right? But you can put one tick every 10th of an integer for every 0.1, or you can put uh, a tick every 10 integers or whatever. And then you can have major and minor ticks and you can, you can add all kinds of things in here and they, they go through and show a bunch of stuff like that. Um, and, it's, and it's quite useful when you're writing huge programs that have a lot of interaction, a lot of displaying and things. Um, but that is what they're doing here. I don't really wanna go through it because it's not really all that fascinating to do this over and over again. It's all pretty much the same. Suffice it to say that for just about everything that you create in MATLAB, there is a way to assign a handle to it and adjust or manipulate the properties either through the property uh, inspector, which is the window that pops up separately, or within the code of your script directly, which and both of them have their place. Both of them have, are convenient in different ways. And now we're gonna move on to something that most students find a little more interesting and that is animation. And this is the beginning of um, digital animation actually. This is how digital animation works. And um, 
it's not the most basic, I suppose, not the most fundamental way that it works, but it's certainly much more fundamental than most digital animators ever ever learn. Uh, so if you become, if you work, end up working for a company that actually programs the, you know, programs the the base code for digital animation, um, this is more like the the kinds of things that you will uh, be doing. So this is halfway down the page, 578 at this point. So we're going to start off with um, some code that we've done before, plenty of. Defining things like X again. Let's see, in this case, it's not an X we've used today yet. So we'll just do a new one. We're just gonna go from X equals negative 10 to 10, looks like. And we're gonna do it in small steps though. So we're gonna go from negative 10 in tiny steps of 100th, so 0 0.01, and then we're gonna go all the way to 10. Suppress that output. So it's a 2,000, it's got 2,000 uh, elements in the array. Then we're going to go ahead and say that k equals negative 1. This is going to be an index of some kind. Um, and then we're going to define our y in terms of k and x. So y is going to equal k times x. And we're going to square x, dot squaring x because it's a large array, right? We're going to subtract 2 from that and suppress it. And then we're going to find, we're going to, we're going to uh, define a plot and assign it a handle. So h is going to equal the plot of x and y again. We're going to suppress the output of that so we don't print all the properties to the screen. But it will plot this. Looks, you know, like a hill or something. Right? We're going to go ahead and turn on the grid here so we can see, you know, kind of a grid behind our thing here. So there's our grid. We're going to give it some axes. Well, we're going to define the axes more appropriately said, I suppose. We're going to define from negative 10 to 10. And from negative 100 to 100. Oops, what did I do? I need to put it into square brackets because it's a set of numbers. That's what. Okay, so what we've done is made our, we've essentially just made our y axes, uh, forced our y axes to be much bigger than they were. And we're forcing our x-axis to stay the same size as they were. The reason that we're doing this is because we're going to animate this line, and we don't want the we don't want the uh, axes to adjust as we animate it. We want the we want the axes to stay still and just the uh, the plot to move. If you don't if you don't set your axes to a particular value, and we and uh, we could have done that using, you know, a, a figure handle command or something if we wanted to. But if you don't set that equal to it, then every time you go through and animate the next version of this, it's going to, um, it, it very likely may reset the figure and cause not just the line to animate, but the entire figure window to animate, which you don't want. You just want the actual line to animate. So we lock up the figure window into a certain set of axes and then we go ahead and do our animation. And our animation is going to be a while loop, which many animations are loops. That's, that's just a fact of, of nature, programming wise, <laughs> anyway. So we're gonna say that while k is less than one, and of course k is less than one, we called it negative one. So while k, we'll say that while k is less than one, we're gonna do the following stuff. We're gonna say that, um, k is going to equal k, which when we first go through it is equal to negative 1. Then we're going to add to that 0 0.01. Okay. Now we're going to suppress that. We're not really interested in printing that to the screen at all. Then we're going to say that y is going to equal k times x, 
We've seen this before. We're going to square x again, and we're going to subtract 2. Then we're going to go ahead and plot. So we're going to plot, but we're only going to replot the y data because the x is going to stay the same. And we're going to set that equal to the thing we just called y. So what we've done is we've set the y data of, we've re essentially reset in our, in our um, plot handle. So in the, the thing that we've saved, the properties of our plot, we're going to reset the y data to equal y again. And we just said it was equal to this again, but we changed what k was. So every time we go through this, we're going to change what k is. We're going to increase it by 0.01. And then we're gonna go through again, we're gonna increase K by 0 0.01, which changes Y just a little bit every time we go through here. And then every time we go through here, we reset the data, the Y data in the H plot to equal this Y thing that we've just created. So we go ahead and do that. And then we allow it to redraw, which calls, which is a command called draw now. And if you do the draw now command, it doesn't wait until the while loop is over to redraw it. It just redraws it right then at that moment. Then we go ahead and end this. And we see what happens. And look at that. That's an animation. That's exciting. Now you're ready to, to do your first animated cartoon or your first animated video game or something, right? Believe it or not, Every single animation that you see digitally is based on something simple like this. It's based on a, a mathematical construct of some kind that represents a movement in time. And of course, um, when you're animating something much more complex, the, the math becomes much more complex. But really what it is, it's not one mathematical problem that's super complex. It's many, many mathematical problems that are very simple that have all been put into the same, the same loop, all, in, all put in the same Y loop. So if you've ever seen digital animation before it's complete, you see these wireframes. You ever seen these wireframes where it has like a picture of an octopus or something that doesn't look like an octopus, it looks like some kind of wireframe. Let's take a look at what this looks like here. Let's look at uh, octopus, octopus wireframe. So here is uh, animation of an octopus with its wireframe, if it's gonna play it maybe. In Pixar, it's actually a septopus instead of an octopus because it only has seven arms. Um, <laughs> so here they show the wire frame. Let's see if they're going to show it animated. Maybe not. The circle. So we're going to define this angle, theta 2. Let's see. No, it's all right. We're not there yet. We need to go back to halfway down page 579. We need to start the program before we finish it. Um, so we're actually going to clear out and clear the window here. Uh, I don't know if they cleared, cleared out the figure. I don't think so, I, but I'm going to because they're going to use a new figure. Um, so we're going to start with theta equal a, lin a linear spaced group of numbers. We're going to go now from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in, in steps of when we're going to do a thousand steps between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So a thousand steps. That's our first array. Of, that's our array of angles. 
And then we're gonna go ahead and define X equal the linear space array of numbers between uh, zero and 2000 in steps of 20. So those are, so is that right? Zero and, no, that's 1000. I did that wrong. We want them to be the same size. So between zero and 1000 in steps of 20. So now they're the same size. That's correct. And then we're going to define y. y is going to equal 20 times the cosine of theta. Now we have a third array of 1,000 numbers. And then we're going to plot. So we're going to plot x and y. So this gives us a similar thing to before, not exactly the same. If you look at the if you look at the axes, this is actually a much bigger kind of bump than the last ones, but it's similar. Uh, we're going to we're going to lock our axes in to these values here, negative one to one to twenty one, and negative one to twenty one again. And we'll lock those in. And then we're going to do the hold on. We're gonna we're gonna freeze this onto the onto the figure window for the time being. Then we're gonna define our new theta, our theta two. And our theta two is also gonna be a linear uh, a linear space of numbers here. But we're going to go now from where do we go? Going from negative pi to pi. So we're going to take out all this stuff. Let's go from negative pi to pi. Like this. And um, we're going to define another set of x's. We're going to call xc. And that's going to be equal to the cosine of theta 2. 2. Oops, I did this wrong. I needed to define theta two, not theta. This is theta two. There we go. And now we're going to define our uh, xc. xc is going to equal cosine of theta two. Just like that. Good. <laughs> Whoa, I put my thing in the wrong place. There we go. There's our uh, cosine. We're going to do also a y of c. Now we're doing, we do an x and a y here because um, to plot a circle, which is what we're trying to do, you have to actually have um, it is, a circle is not a function, it's not a mathematical, mathematical function. So you have to do a little bit of. Um, a little bit of magic, mathematical magic. Thing. If you've ever tried to plot a circle in a, in a computer, you have done something similar to this probably. Um, now we're gonna do T equals this thing we call patch. Now what is patch? We're gonna go ahead and put it in here and then we're gonna look it up. Because whenever you find something in MATLAB you're not sure about, you always just look it up, right? Now what it does is it's actually gonna make this thing look like, like a ball, I guess you could say. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and look that up anyway. So let's look up help patch and see what it tells us. So this is another one of those, uh, this is another tool that is used specifically for animation. It says it creates one or more filled polygons using X and Y as the coordinates for each vertex. Now, remember when I mentioned while we were looking at the octopus 
that you have this grid of lines and, and then they fill in between the grid with kind of an average. That's what patch does. Patch does that, um, that rendering between, between the functions, between the animated functions. Now patch is a very simple one. It essentially just fills it in with a color. When, when you use render man to do this, which is Pixar's version of the patch function, render man is a huge, huge program that allows you not to just fill in between the gaps with, with color, but also with shading. And you, and you can actually do that here as well. You can do some shading, but also allows you to do a ton of texture kinds of things. Um, lots of different colors. This, this has limited uh, amounts of color that you can do. Um, but it essentially has taken the two graphs and filled in between. Well, what are the two graphs? When we, when we, when we created this, um, this XC and YC, what we were doing is we were creating a top half of the circle and a bottom half of the circle, and then Patch plotted those two things with a filling in between. The filling in this case is red. You could change that filling to blue, you could change it to black, whatever you want to. Um, and it hasn't given it any shading, but I believe that you can. Let's see if, if what uh, options we have down here. Polygons, coordinates, 3D view, HLI, similar path. Um, okay, data, patch faces versus. Um, Structure S. Yeah, so down here in this one, in these last ones here, you can start to put in more, more things. Um, essentially, through the through the property, um, through the properties uh, thing, the properties window that comes up, you can start to to mess around with that. There are other ways to do it. When you assign a handle to it, of course, you can do it as well. But it starts to get fairly complex. It's pretty good for you know basic animation and basic CGI, but nothing nothing compared to what can be done uh, in I would say Hollywood, but most most digital animation is not done anywhere near Hollywood. It's mostly done in other places, but in the movies I should say. All right. So anyway, we've got that now. We've created our little red ball on there. And now we're going to actually create the animation. So we're going to create a for loop. We're now going to go to hold off. Okay. We don't want we we don't want this thing to not um, be able to move now, so we're going to turn the hold off and we're going to create our for loop. And this is about half uh, third of the way down page three eighty. For j equals, we're going to go from one to the length of our our first theta, which means we actually have to redefine theta. I'm going to redefine the first theta um, properly. So the first theta was equal to, um, well, I can just back up and see what it was equal to. The first theta was equal to this thing here. So I'm just going to redefine that really quick so that it's saved properly over here. And then I'm going to do for um, j equals one to the length of theta. And then we're going to have the following code. We're going to, we're going to define a new X. We're going to call X new. X new is going to equal the old X, which was called XC. And we're going to add to it X J. This is page 580, about a third of the way down. So what does that do? What that does is it takes the it takes the points in XC, which is you know a uh, this array here, and it adds to them these points that are in X a piece at a time. So it adds the first one in X. So remember that X is this number. If we go back in our code, X is this number that goes from zero to a thousand in steps of 20. So it's gonna, it's gonna step forward every point in this ball, 20 things this way, 20 pieces this way. 
Well, it goes from X, sorry, it goes from X to zero to 20 and there's 2000. So it steps it forward. Um, it's gonna step it forward one thousandth of a, of a step to the right. Every point in here is gonna to step to the right one thousandth of a step. And then the next, can you guess what the next step's gonna be? The next thing's gonna be? Well, it's gonna be very similar, except instead of stepping it to the right, we're gonna step it up, right? So we're gonna we're gonna step it up. We're gonna define a, a y nu. Oops, y nu is going to equal y c, and we're gonna to add to each thing in y c a little bit of y, and it, it changes the step size is going to change as you go through the loop because as you go through the loop j changes. J is going to increase as it goes through the loop. And so this number is going to increase. So this, so essentially it's going to climb up and up and up and up. And it's going to follow this pattern because uh, XC and YC follow that pattern. All right. So now we're gonna use, let's see, did we, yeah. So earlier in our code, when we used the patch command, we had, we, uh, so the patch command is a plotting type command. So we attached this patch plot, a handle T. So now this has a, a plot handle T, and now we can use that plot handle inside the loop because plot handles you can use in the code. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna say, we're gonna change, um, so we're gonna change uh, one of the one of the properties of the plot T, we're going to change the X data property of T, and we're going to let it equal this X new that we've defined. So now the plot is going to be actually given this new value X we call X new, and we're going to do the same thing um, with the Y with the Y one this one here. So we're going to put in. T dot y data equals y new. So now we've actually we've so we've added numbers to the arrays. Now we're going to put those new arrays x new and y new back into the plot. So we'll actually move. It'll actually change the numbers in the plot. This is this is changing the numbers using the plot handle for the patch plot that we used earlier. Then the last thing to do is to draw it out again. Draw it again into the in the middle of the loop, and then to end our loop. And if we've done this correctly, the ball should animate, and it should follow the plot because we essentially are what, what we're doing here is we're reanimating or re, we're redrawing that ball two thousand times or a thousand times or whatever it is. It's a lot of times. However many steps we took. Um, in X and Y, when we first defined X and Y. When we first defined X and Y, we defined them as 1,000. There were 1,000 values for X and 1,000 values for Y. And we redraw this ball using the patch command 1,000 times, but every time we redraw it, we shift the numbers that we draw it at slightly. And that's what that for loop does. It shifts the numbers, and then it puts those numbers back into the plot handle, and then redraws the plot. But we don't have to go through and redefine all the numbers again. We just, for, for each, we don't have to redefine the numbers and plot again. We just redefine the numbers inside the plot handle, inside the defined uh, properties of the plot that we've done, only done once. And believe it or not, that actually becomes much, much faster from a programming point of view. If we didn't use this, this version, of the, this plot handle version, we would actually have to replot every time. In this one, we're just redrawing. We're not actually going in and using the plot command many, many times. So the plot command has a lot more to it than just redrawing the same plot with some slightly different data. So it makes it much faster and it makes the animation run faster, which is really what you want when you want an animation that's believable. When you want an animation that's believable, you want a lot of spatial detail. So you want your pixels to be very small, but you also want a lot of temporal detail which means you want your time 
stamps to be very small. And that's what we've done here in both ways. This allowed us to, the, the number of steps we broke this down into gave us our spatial resolution. And the number of times we go through this loop gives us our temporal resolution. So there is an animation. All right, what time is it? Almost 2.30. Let's take a little bit of a break and we'll come back and do the move, the section on movies and some others, some other techniques at the end here. Um, and then we'll be done. Sound good? We'll take a break for about five minutes or so.
All right. Whew. Okay. Now, movies. Now, what's the difference between animations and movies? Well, I don't know. <laughs> We generally, we generally in MATLAB call an animation something that is more two-dimensional, whereas a movie is more three-dimensional. So instead of just having lines and shapes, it has surfaces, uh, volumes, things like this. So, um, so we're going to do, uh, we're going to show you that as well. All right, so let's get in here. Let's, let's close our figure window. No, let's just clear it. Um, all right. Okay, so we're going to define our x again. X is going to equal uh, zero to pi. We're doing kind of an angle thing again here, pi over 100 to four pi. Oops, <laughs> I made a sad face instead of a zero. I think that's a sad face. Isn't that a sad face when you put the, um, I'm terrible with emojis and text speak. I don't hardly ever use texting in my life. Then Y is gonna equal uh, X. So we have two of these things. These Both of these arrays have the same uh, the same values in the United States. And then we're going, and there's a typo here, but here we're going to use the mesh grid function to define two new variables, big X and big Y. And this is going to allow us to have this, uh, to, to have this surface kind of thing going on. So a big X and big Y is going to equal mesh grid of X and Y. If you don't remember what mesh grid does, just open up big X and big Y when you're done making the mesh grid and look at it. It'll become a little obvious what it does there. Um, essentially it makes a two dimensional array. Uh, out, of a, out of a one dimensional array, same values. And then uh, Z is going to equal now three times the sine of uh, big X, everything in big X, three times the sign of that, plus cosine of big Y. Oops, I did it again. Okay. Now we're going to assign a handle H to this surface plot. of x, y, and z. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Yeah, that's what we want to do. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we create this thing. Now this is, uh, cre it's created this in a black, with, with a black uh, color map. So you can't really see what's going on, but this is a plot we've seen before. So we can actually change the shading if we want to. We can change the axes. We can do all kinds of things. They actually do uh, fix the axes. So they're gonna fix the axis to be, and remember there are three axes this time. So you have to, you have to fix all three of them. They're gonna go from zero to four pi and zero to four pi on the X and Y axes. So zero comma four times pi uh, then comma, no, yes, comma, zero comma four times pi comma. And then on the Z axis, they're gonna go um, from negative three to three, it looks like. And the, the um, yeah. so the Z axis is this one, negative three comma to three. 
That looks correct. All right. So that's essentially giving it a little bit more, uh, it's filled it, filled it up a little bit. It's actually cutting off the tops of this thing, it looks like, a little bit. Then we're gonna uh, change the shading a little bit. Instead of just being a straight black and white, um, we're going to change it to um, an interpolated shading. Interp, oops. And we're gonna change the color map as well to a jet color map. It's a little more blue, I think, maybe. No, a little more red, actually. Um, and then we're gonna do a for loop that's gonna animate this surface or make a movie out of this. Surface. So 4K equals uh, zero pi zero, to two pi in steps of pi over 100. So we're gonna go in steps of pi divided by 100 and we're gonna go all the way to two pi. And we're going to let Z change. Z is now going to equal the sine of big X plus the cosine of big Y which is what it was before. Remember, that's what uh, that's what uh, well it was kind of that. It was actually three times the sine of big X plus the cosine of big Y. But it was so it was similar to that. But now we're going to multiply both of these things, put this all in parentheses, and multiply both of these things by the sine of K, which changes every time we go through the loop. Right. So we're going to do dot times. The sine of k. Since k changes every time we go through the loop, it actually increases every time we go through the loop. This should make uh, for some interesting movement of the of the points as we as we move through this thing. Then we're going to redefine the properties of our of our um, surface, which we call h, our surface plot, which we call h. So h dot we're going to redefine the z data because that's the thing that we um, re redefined in this thing. And we're going to let it equal to the z that we redefined here. Simple enough. We're going to use the draw now function. And then we're going to go ahead and end our function, end our for loop. Oh, I did something weird. Z down down. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. The D should be capitalized. Well, that sucks. Let's see here. Gosh. No, I didn't mean that. Okay, so H dot Z data, like that. Yeah. yeah equals Z, okay, draw, there we go. So as we're going through this, we essentially have a, we have a sine function going one way, a cosine function going another way. And that's what gives us those wavy bumps. And then in this direction, we're actually, uh, we're actually going from negative pi to zero pi. And then we're plugging that number into another sine function and multiplying it by all these things. So we have a sine function going this way as well. We have 
we have waves and waves, <laughs> essentially. So you get that funky thing. Right? And you can do all kinds of things with this. You have a lot of options um, when you're doing something like this. You could do, instead of the sign of, of, of well, you can't actually change it when, when you've already run it. But um, let's say that I, I want to change what's going on here. So I'm gonna just do a different for loop. So I'm gonna paste this down here. And instead of going from uh, here, I'm gonna go from, I'm going to do it. In, I'm going to do it in shorter and uh, in uh, bigger steps first of all, and I'm going to go um, to maybe seven pi or something. I'm going to change that slightly, and then on my next line, when I redefine z, I'm going to redefine z in a very different way. I'm going to copy that line and put it down here. And I'm going to redefine z maybe as um, I'm going to leave this the same, but I'm going to change this. The reason I'm going to leave this the same is because it will allow for a smooth transition from my original plot to my final plots. But this over here can be something uh, different. I'm going to call it the natural log of k or something like that. Um, sure, why not? Actually, let's do one. Uh, let's do the tangent of k. Why not? That should get weird. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go ahead and redefine the properties in my handle. And then I'm gonna draw it now. And then I'm going to go ahead and end it and see what happens. So that's, this does two, two very interesting things. It moves very much faster and it also gets much bigger. And you can see that it doesn't just get much bigger smoothly. It gets much bigger and then stops. Why does it get much bigger and stops? Because the tangent looks like a function that goes, it starts off at zero and then it gets rapidly huge to infinity. And then it goes actually to negative infinity and rapidly gets to zero again. So it jumps, it has a jump in it, it's not continuous. The sine function is continuous. This one's not continuous. And you see that. You see it go boom, 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 because that's what the tangent function does. Let's see what happens if I do this. With, and and um, let's, actually, let's actually change some other things and see what we can do. So let's copy this, put this down here, paste, copy this. Let's see if we can. Um, Let's um, let's do k times x plus cosine y, and let's do uh, uh, k or sorry k times. Let's do times two to the k. So I'm raising two to the k power and um, doing that. Then we'll do this line. And, and then we'll, end, we'll draw now and we'll end it. So instead of just going back and forth now, it's actually taken a graph and it's shifted it to the right and done some weird thing to it, right? Hopefully now you can see how there's, there's all kinds of things you can do with this math to a simple surface. And you can do it to a volume as well. And that's where you start to get to animation that starts to make sense. You, you can make a volume that's shaped like LeBron James, for example. And then you can write a mathematical function that allows him to extend the arm out this way, like he's doing a right-handed layup, and then have his right leg come off the ground like he would be doing with a right-handed layup. This is essentially 
very at a very fundamental and simplistic level how digital animation works. We're getting we're getting even closer to it. So uh, you can do this with you can also do this with um, you can make a movie of or an animation or a movie with a Mandelbrot fractal or some other kind of fractal where you can cause it to instead of just show up as an image, you can actually cause it to draw. You can cause it to, to iterate each one after the other. And then you can see how one drawing of the Mandelbrot fractal becomes, is drawn over and over again, is repeated over and over again to create this great big repeating kind of fractal, this recursive fractal, this recursive um, image. And they do that actually here in example 14.2. I wish I could just copy all that code and show you, but I, I don't really want to type it all out. I probably have it saved somewhere in all the years I've taught this class, but I don't really want to type it all out. But you can do it, and it's using the same techniques um, as we've used so far. Uh, I think that that example uses more of the techniques from the previous section rather than the one we just did. Let's take a look here. Yeah. It uses a fairly, it's, it's using just the, a two dimensional, fairly simple thing. There's a lot of code there, but um, they also do something in here that's, um, that is probably uh, might be interesting for you when you do your homework. In here, right in the middle, of, or right about a third of the way down page 583, they actually, uh, they actually zoom in on the on the plot by um, let's see, do they use handles to do that or not? Doesn't look like they do. So they're actually just using they're they're actually using the g input function. If you remember the uh, the g input function is the one where you uh, where it puts a cursor on your image and then you can click points. And so what they're doing is they're writing a little bit of code where you can click on the image and it will zoom into the spot that you click. So that code is right in there. And I believe that um, I believe that there's a homework problem that I'm going to assign. And that's something I didn't, uh, well, anyway, I haven't done that yet. I think we mentioned that, but I do have the, the problem picked up. All right, so, um, Let's move on to 14.4, uh, one point one other visualization techniques. Here we're going to talk about um, transparent transparency, which of course is important for animation and and movies uh, for digital animation. Uh, lighting, which of course is important for that. So lighting, which in, which would include the direction the light comes from and the shading that makes that look real, look like it's actually doing what it should do. And then um, volume visualization, they call it. So uh, essentially, instead of having a surface that you're going to represent um, using different techniques, you can actually represent things inside the volume, inside the surface with different uh, code, different ways to see things inside it. So starting with transparency, we're on page 585 time to do this. Let's clear out. All right, so we're going to start off by defining this uh, n equals 20, which is going to be an index. <clears throat> then we're going to define theta, capital theta, is going to be linearly spaced numbers between negative pi and pi. Um, and there's going to be 20 of them, maybe pi and pi and 20 numbers. Um, but we're going to use n instead of 20, so we can change n later if we want to. This is a this is a trick that we've seen a few times in in uh, this class, where instead of instead of rewriting n inside the code inside the the min space command, you define n here at the beginning. And then you, all you have to do is redefine n at the beginning of your code if you're going to use it over and over again. And we are going to use it, I believe, more than once here. So it's good to have it defined here. Yeah, we are using it at least twice. Um, 
it looks like. So if you're if you're using a number many times over and over again, you might as well define it once, and then if you need to change it later, you can redefine it. That's especially important when you're doing uh, things that, um, well, the, like the example, that, like the thing that I'm doing, I talked about earlier, where I, I'm, I have a video that I'm extracting images from. I don't know actually how many seconds are in each video. I don't want to go and look it up. What I want to do is I just want MATLAB to take an image out every second until, it, until the video is over. And so I don't want to redefine the number of things in it. I just define this number at the beginning, and and then if I I, I don't have to read I don't have to redefine it in a, in every point of the code. I just define it at the beginning. And I and in my code I can actually make MATLAB define it because if I assign a handle to my video, then I can have MATLAB look up the properties in the handle, look up the in the property inspector, and it can actually assign n to equal one of the properties inside whatever I've assigned the handle to, whatever I assigned the image handle to. So it's, it's a very useful tool, that, that handle idea and uh, assigning values at the beginning of your code. Anyway, just something we've seen before and I wanted to point out. We're gonna go ahead and suppress that. Uh, we'll also define phi, capital phi, another Greek letter. And that will be lin space, um, let's see, negative, Pi over two to pi over two and with number n. So pi over two to pi over two and hmm. so we got theta, we got phi, and then we're going to define a little theta. Little theta is going, uh, oh no, wait. So, yeah, so actually, we're doing a mesh grid here. They keep forgetting to put that first thing. So, mesh grid of theta and phi, we're going to create little theta and little phi now. They did it backwards last time they did it. You know, most of the times they've done little to big, this time they've done big to little. And we're going to mesh grid these big ones. Big theta, big phi, to make little theta, little phi. Then I'm going to define big X to equal cosine of little phi, which is the mesh grid matrix. And we're going to dot times because we're multiplying together matrices, right? Cosine theta. Cosine phi, cosine theta. Let's see. Yeah. Don't need that. All right. No, what did I do? X cosine phi times dot times cosine. Theta. Did I? See that time. Oh, I see what I did. Need to take off both of them. I only took off one of them. All right, there we go. So whenever. Um, Whenever they give you this error in valid expression that says miss, uh, use parentheses or check for mismatched delimiters, what you're looking for is either too many or too few parentheses. I had too many parentheses right there. So that's the one I had to take out. I took out the one on the right, but I didn't take out the one on the left. So that's what, the, that's what that particular error message means, just in case you're wondering. All right, so we have defined X. Now we can define Y. Y is going to equal uh, cosine phi time, dot times sine theta. And sine theta there. All right. And we're going to define big Z sine phi. All right. Now we're going to do a surface plot. 
X, Y, and Z. Big X, big Y, big Z. So there's our surface plot. We're gonna choose our axis to be square axes. That's one of the commands you can use with the axis command. Uh, gives us the same values on each axis so that it um, plots very symmetrically. Then we're gonna change the axis to be a bigger square. So instead of um, being going from negative one to one on each axis, we're gonna go from negative two to two on each axis. And it's still being, gonna be a square axis, um, but it's gonna be uh, just bigger. So that our sphere appears small. Okay, now we're going to hold that figure in place for a bit. And they want us to put in a two second pause. Just to kind of give us a starting point. And then we're going to uh, add another one. We're going to do another surface. Now, actually, I should have written this all in the I'm going to copy this all into a script file when we're done so we can run it later. That's okay. Here we go. Now we're going to do a surface, uh, another surface plot. And this is actually going to be the same one as before, except multiplied by two. So it's just a bigger, a bigger one. So two times x, two times y, two times z. And we'll pause for two seconds. And then we're going to set the transparency level, which is used by, done by using the alpha code, 0.5. Alpha is the, the um, assignment for the transparency in the uh, properties of the surface plot. And so now you can see through the spheres slightly. It's a half, halfway transparency. Alpha one, I think, is fully non-transparent, I think. Let's check that. Alpha one, yeah, so it's non-transparent. And then alpha zero is fully transparent. All you see is the, all you see is the wire grid. All right, so we're gonna take all this code and run it and See what we get. Okay, pretty simple. Just three things going on there. Now we're going to go ahead and clear our figure. Down here. We're going to assign a handle to each of these surface plots. So the first one we're going to call H1 equals surf XYZ. And then the second one is going to be called H2 And then we're going to uh, just change the surface of the second one. So I'm going to take out this pause here. And I'm just going to change this one. So it's going to be H. I'm going to, I'm going to actually use the, the um, handle for H2. So I'm going to do H2 dot, and you can use face alpha, face uppercase alpha. And we're going to let that equal point three here, and now we're going to run it. So you can, and you can even, um, so another thing that we can do 
that they don't do is that we can animate this so that it changes gradually. You could actually, you can actually animate the alpha. You could animate the, you could make the outer sphere disappear, for example. Um, you can even, you can even make the lines, the, the grid lines of the, the surface disappear. And you can do that by using similar techniques that we did before using a while loop or a for loop that changes things slightly as the loop goes forward. You know, you would, you would have a, uh, an index in a for loop called K and K could go from one or from, from uh, you could say K goes from uh, zero to one or something like that in steps of 0.1 or steps of 0 0.01. So you have a hundred different steps. And then you could have, you could have your alpha changing with K. You could say alpha uh, face alpha equals K. And then it would slowly, uh, the sphere would slowly appear. Um, so all kinds of things you can do with this stuff when you're, when you've learned these uh, techniques. So here, uh, so that's uh, transparency. What's the next one? Hidden lines. So in this one, we're gonna, we're gonna actually hide. Um, let's see, are we gonna hide the lines or are we gonna bring them all in here? Yeah. Okay, so um, in this particular case, you can see the you can see the grid lines uh, or the 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 uh, wire grid lines. These are called the wire grid lines. The wire grid lines that form the shape on the front, but you can also see the ones on the back. And so you can actually turn those off. The um, if you those the lines that are behind the shape are called the hidden lines. So if you put hidden off, um, it should hide them. Oh, actually we need to do it um, right after we plot it. So we're, uh, let's, let's just go ahead and do um, Let's do another one. Let's just do another mesh. Of uh, X, Y, and Z. There we go. And then we can do hidden off. And you can see on that inside sphere, it's it's uh, taken off. It's turned off these lines here. Um, Could do the same thing with the other one. But let's see if we can. Uh, let's clear the clear the figure and do it again. We can do. Um, what's this square? And we can do hidden now. So. Now it's brought them, it's brought, now you can see them all again. Let's see, no, hidden on, sorry. And now you can't. So when, the, when hidden is on, it hides the back ones. When hidden is off, it shows the back ones, the backside ones. So anyway. Then uh, manipulating lighting, so we can actually uh, do some lighting. Here. Let's Oh, actually, um, sorry, I made a mistake because I created this file called Sphere, so I need to actually delete it or rename it maybe, called Sphere One, Sphere One, because then I can't do this Sphere, Sphere, Sphere. 
There we go. So in MATLAB, you can actually just call up a sphere like this if you want to. And then you can actually give it some lighting on the surface of it. So we're using this, this cam light feature, which makes, it, which makes it look like there's a light coming from here. So it looks like there's a little reflection right there. Um, and we can actually make one that's much higher resolution if we wanted to, a sphere, and then it would look more realistic. But the cam light, the, it's essentially the camera light, the light on the camera, um, you can choose to where you want it to be. So you can do cam light left, and that changes it, changes the, the lighting more to the left. You can do a cam light headlight. Uh, I don't even know all the ones you can do. There's, I think, quite a few different lighting options. So left, right, headlight. Um, then you can actually um, then you can actually choose where it is. You can actually decide exactly where you want it to come by choosing an azimuth and an elevation. So an azimuth is essentially your your direction, uh, your angle from the from the sphere in this plane, the floor plane here, or the XY plane. So this is the XY plane. So if you choose an angle um, from the X axis towards the Y axis, which would be, I believe this direction. If you choose 90 degrees, um, which is pi over two, then your light would come from this direction. And then your elevation is um, up or down. So you up pi over two takes you to here, down pi over two takes you to here. And let's actually do that really quick. See if we can, um, see if that is work, gonna work out for us. We're gonna do cam light and we're gonna choose our, our azimuth first. Or so I'm gonna choose pi over two and try to get the light to come um, from this direction. Actually, let's try to get it to come from this direction which would be pi over four. So let's do pi over four. Um, and then I want to do, I want it to come from uh, down. I want the light to shine down here now. So that'll be negative pi over four. I think, and let's see if it, see if I got it right. See if I got the directions right. Yeah, so it's brought the light further down here. If I wanted to shift it more to the right, then I would do maybe pi over. Uh, so coming from this side over here, maybe we just uh, do zero. Let's see if we can get it to to shift over to this side. And see if that works. Uh, not really. Let's see, azimuth is. Let's go to pi. Let's go the other direction. Let's go to pi. No. Oh, I see what this is doing. This is not doing what I thought it did. This is a, this is actually widening the amount of light. So it's making the light bigger. Um, no, that's not right. It should do it. Oh, I see what I did. Uh, cam light azimuth elevation. Oh, my, oh, yes, 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 yes. Let's do, let's go back to another one. Anyway, the point is, I, I'm not sure exactly how all these work currently. If I go back to uh, cam lights left, for example, it just, oh, I see what it's doing. It's just keeping all those lights. Let's uh, do hold off and then do cam light left. Oh, it's still just adding more lights. <laughs> so I'm just adding more lights, apparently. But, um, uh, let's see, I think you can turn them all off too, but I'm not sure how to do that. Anyway, you can do lighting. And this doesn't look very impressive because the resolution is so low. The higher resolution you have, the more of these lines you have and the smaller the boxes become. Each box is essentially a pixel. And so the smaller, the, the more lines you have, the closer the together they are and the more pixels you have. And this starts to look more and more like a real object. Um, and so you can start to imagine what it uh, would seem like, hopefully.
you don't have time to make another object. But. So let's look at uh, some more stuff, this time with volumes. This is the very last section starting on the bottom of page 587, but really the data, the, the code starts on page 588. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to create some things inside of a volume. Right? So far we've just you know, created a surface and moved the surface and we put color on the surface and we've, we've put shading on the surface. But now, what if we want to go inside of an object? There are different ways to represent uh, things inside of an object. So first of all, we got to create some arrays again. Let's do our figure and clear everything out. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's go from X equals one to three, very small array. And then Y we're gonna define as three, uh, four numbers, two, four, six, and eight. Um, and Z equals 10 and 20. Now this is something that I mentioned at some point, um, I don't remember when, but I mentioned this at some point that you can use mesh grid to um, combine things of different, combine matrices of different sizes and to use them uh, so that you can use them together. So here we have three different matrices, one that's a one by three, one that's a one by four, one that's a one by two. And now we're gonna use the mesh grid function to do to to combine them in such a way into two into um, two by two matrices that um, two dimensional matrices that can we can do math with essentially so we're gonna call these three new matrices x y and z and we're gonna use the mesh grid function remember the mesh grid function looks at all the things that you're using in it and creates these new matrices, these two by two matrices that you can do math with. I do X, Y, and Z inside there. We're gonna create big X, Y, and Z. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a look at them. So notice here, these are actually three dimensional matrices because we did use three of them, which makes sense. Before we had a, a, three, a one by three, a one by four, and a one by two. Now each of these matrices is a three dimensional matrix, which means they have pages to them. It's four rows, three columns, and two pages. So four by three by two, a four by three by two, a four by three by two. That means you can do math with these matrices. And that's a hugely important tool um, to, to use. Why, why and where would you use this? Well. Oftentimes when you're dealing with data, you're dealing with data that is related to each other, that you know, different sets of data that are related to each other, but they have different amounts of things in them, right? Um, one set of data might be, uh, uh, I can't, I'm trying to imagine a scenario. Do they give us a name here? Um, Uh, one of them might contain, so they're, they're talking about uh, MRI and flow field data, I suppose, which they, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if these things are actually in MATLAB still, but um, let's say that we're doing, we're, we're taking medical data from a bunch of people or something. And you have, let's say we have 100 patients we're doing a study on and we take data from 100 patients, 100 different blood samples, 100 different uh, blood pressure samples, 100 different temperatures for every you know, person in the study. However, we also are taking data during the day of the temperature of the room that these, these people are in. And the room, we're gonna take the temperature 10 times a day. Well, that's not a hundred things, that's 10 things, right? But each one of those 10 temperatures is gonna be used to, to, we're gonna multiply them or add them to some things that we take from the, from the 
from the uh, patient. And so we have to mesh grid those two things together. And not only that, but we have instruments in the room. Let's say we have seven instruments in the room that are, that are the instruments for taking the blood, taking the, the blood pressure. And each one of those we're gonna be looking at to look at their calibration or something, to look at something in the instrument that affects how the, how the data is taken from each patient. Well, there's seven of those numbers and we're gonna take, you know, we're gonna take that data out um, 15 times a day or something like that. Whatever it is, all of these things have different amounts of data in them, but they're all gonna be used together to make some calculation. So you make a mesh grid of them and the mesh grid creates these multiple dimensional matrices that allow you to do the math. And it's, I, th I think, I sometimes I think that people are really confused by this, but let's look at X. X is the numbers one, two, three. And the big X is when we open it up, if we can open it up. Here we go. It's those numbers, one, two, three in the first drawer, one, two, three in the second drawer. One, two, I mean, I mean, these are just one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's all those numbers in X, but it's arranged into a matrix so that it can be multiplied with the other matrices and you're still doing the math correctly, right? The same thing with big Y. They've created big Y is two, or little y is 2468. Big Y is gonna be 2468, 2468, 2468, but it's a two, four by three by two, just like big X is a four by two by two. These things have the same uh, amount of rows, columns, and pages. And the same with Z. Z was before 10 and 20. And now Z is 10 and 20, right? Because it's thing was in the two, right? So the, the X, the big X changes in the rows. The big Y changes in the columns and the big Z changes in the pages. And that's, I mean, if you're doing, if you've, if you've never done any high end kind of matrix algebra, it immediately starts to click, I think. But um, hopefully you can kind of see how this will work work to, to help us do that. All right, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the idea of the mesh grid when we start getting into volumes and three-dimensional stuff, uh, gives us a little more idea of that. Now let's see if wind, this wind file of data is actually here. Let's see if we can load wind. If it's in that, it is, hey, look at that. That's great. I'm gonna go ahead and clear some things and then do that again. So we're gonna load this uh, data file called wind. Now, when you're, when you're measuring wind, um, you have to measure it in three dimensions. It has to be uh, you know, north, south, east, west, up, down, right? And so that's what these things, that's what we're measuring here. Um, we have uh, W, sorry, uh, X, Y, Z, and U, V, W. X, Y, Z are, um, I believe that X is going to be, see if I can open it and see. Um, yeah, so, uh, X is the raw data, I think, where this is measured in, let's see. I don't know what the units this would be in. This can't, this can't be in meters per second. That'd be way too fast. Unless it was in the middle of a tornado or a hurricane. <laughs> Maybe it is. Um, but this is going to be a, um, this is gonna be the raw data that's actually, that tells you the speed of the wind in this direction. And then um, U is going to be a, a more a normalized version of this that is going to have, um, that's going to be essentially divided by some number to, to, give it, um, to give it a different value that's easier for calculating. And I think that's, I think that's what they've done here. Um, Actually, that's not what they've done here. They've done it differently. Okay, so what I think what they've actually done here 
for this wind data is they've defined the beginning and the end of each vector of wind. So, um, find the vector. Yeah, I think that's what it is. So, this is a little bit different than I thought. When 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 I take wind data, I have a tower that does this that takes wind data. It's it's it does it differently than this. But I have a, a sonic anemometer, so maybe that's why it's different. I don't know. This is actually a, a data for wind in an in a volume, and these are the points, apparently where they're taking the data. So these are the x's, the y's are the y's, and so each one of these points, uh, this right here is an x coordinate. In the y, there's a y coordinate. In the z, there's a z coordinate. And then at each of those points, there is a data point for the wind velocity in the x direction, the wind velocity in the y direction, the wind direction in the z direction. In order to do something like this, you would need an incredible amount of, of um, uh, you didn't need an incredible amount of sensors. Like we, the, the funny thing about measuring wind is that usually you see these little like windmill things that are, like little cups or things, they're just like spinning around and around to measure speed, and then this vein that turns a different direction. Those are very low end wind measuring devices. Um, what's usually used is what's called a digital anemometer. A sonic anemometer is more is more the point. It actually has um, six microphones, and it listens for the the sound of the wind. Um, and they're very expensive. They're very accurate. They're very useful and they're very, very expensive. Uh, so there are different types of these. So this is one type where you have these, uh, these four microphones here. The type that I have is more like this. This is actually the very one that I have, but they cost thousands and thousands of dollars each. And to get this many points, you'd need one of these at every point essentially. Um, but it measures the wind as it goes through here, and it and it can actually uh, compare the wind uh, sound measured here with the wind sound measured here, and the difference between those two they uh, determines the speed of the wind and the direction of the wind, and that's each for each one of these prongs on there. Um, you have these, and there there are different brands of them. There, this brand here is made by uh, Gill, I think, and this is made by Campbell Instruments, and so on and so forth. But um, so anyway, the point, the point being is that this would be very difficult to get this data set, um, what they've done. What they've done is they put one of these instruments in a huge volume, like they put a bunch of them in a room like this and measured the data at these, you know, through time, I guess, um, and then got all this data out, which is kind of crazy. That's an incredible amount of data. The other way they could do it, I suppose, is using video cameras and, and uh, lines of smoke through a wind tunnel. I, so if this is a wind tunnel kind of thing, then maybe that's how they do it. And then they can use cameras. It's not gonna be very accurate, but it would give you some idea of it. And anyway, point being is that um, they have this data. So what we're going to do now is we're gonna actually calculate speed using a formula. From this data. And we're going to call this array of numbers speed. We're going to set it equal to square root of. So since we have we have velocities in every direction, we have to use what's called the Pythagorean theorem, if you remember that, to calculate this, since that's what we're doing here is the square root of u squared plus v squared plus uh, w squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem, and it has to be u dot squared, actually plus uh, v dot squared plus uh, equals plus w dot squared. So that's the Pythagorean theorem, square root of the squares of the sides of this three-dimensional, tri this triangle in three dimensions. And that's gonna create a, uh, a new array of numbers that we'll call speed. It's also 35 by 41 by 15. And then we're going to do this, we're gonna use this command called contour slice. So this is interesting. Contour, it's not contour, space slice, contour slice. Um, 
And what this is going to do is it's going to graph these three dimensional matrices as three layers or four layers rather, four layers because it's a, um, because it has enough, well, you could do multiple layers, but essentially we're splitting it into four layers, uh, four sets of data. Um, and I don't know where it's splitting it. Let's see here, contours. It's splitting it uh, along the Z data set, the third dimension data set, I suppose. So um, to do that, we need our three data sets, X, Y, Z for our three different dimensions. And then our fourth, which is the speed, which we just made. And then we're going to uh, leave our first option empty for splitting this, our second one empty and our third one, we're gonna um, Let's see, we're splitting the, we're let's see, is it 53 by 35 by 41 by 15. I don't know, maybe we're doing the first one, I don't know, but can't actually tell which one we're splitting with. But the point is, is that when we do this, we get a, this very interesting, um, this very interesting plot out that gives us the contour map of this, right? Now let's see if I can change this by hand. I don't know if I can, I don't think so. Well, we have to do this by code here. So now we're going to actually um, change this to four different slices. Let's see. Okay, yeah, I know what we do. So the first one we actually showing, we're showing one slice, which is the eighth, it's the eighth level in the um, in the in the it's the eighth page essentially of this three dimensional matrix. So the first one we're just showing the eighth page. This time we're going to show four different pages, and it's going to be pages one, five, ten, and fifteen. So that's that's where we split it into four. So the first one we only showed one slice, and so it can just show it as a map. But this one it's going to actually show them as slices on top of each other, not where we want them to be. Now, if we want them to actually be uh, not on top of each other, we're going to have to have some tools available to us here. How do I open the tools? I don't remember. Let's go to figure window and let's undock this maybe. Here we go, here are some tools. Um, let's rotate 3D, there we go. So when we rotate this in three dimensions, we can see that now that we have five layers, I, um, I left one of my, I left that last one on here and I still have my hold on. But um, it even shows you where the layers are. There's a layer at one, there's one at five, there's one at eight, there's one at 10 and there's one at 15. Then you could do all the layers if you wanted to. But this shows you how things are changing from in this third dimension where it's very difficult to imagine that in three dimensions. It's very difficult to plot it and imagine what that looks like. Now you can also do an, another interest. And remember that this is, the, this is that plot of wind data, right? So this essentially tells you what the wind is doing over time. And you can see it is changing over time. But you can also do a, a different plot to show this. And they, they call this a cone plot. I'm not sure if they actually show the command for that. They don't, I don't know what it is. So let's go find out from the help. Help cone. Uh, let's help cone plot. There we go. So cone plot, I can just plug in the numbers, I guess. Where did I go? Here we go, cone plot. Uh, yeah. 
it's actually going to want x, y, z, and u, v, w. And so let's and let's go ahead and try it. Cone plot. Uh, x, y, z, u, v, w. And let's see what happens. Little figure window again. Didn't do it. Don't know why. Let's do clear figure. Cone plot. Cone plot. X Y Z U V W. Um, that's the last thing you want us to put in there. Oh, we have to we have to do a mesh grid. Uh, let's see. There's cones at the points. There's cones at the points of the vector field. UVW. All right, so we actually have to actually, we actually have to create another vector to do that. But it's it's going to require a mesh grid, which don't have time to do because we're done. But anyway, you can do it, and then you get this this plot that they show in the book that has these cones. These cones are essentially the arrows of the velocity of the wind velocity. The bigger the area, the bigger the arrow, the bigger the velocity, and the direction the arrow is pointing in is the, of course, the direction that the, the wind is pointing in. So that's a very useful um, 3D visualization, and they apparently leave it to the reader to figure it out, and we don't have time for it because we're out of time for class. But um, this is the kind of thing that we're gonna we're gonna try to do in our homework, and I do have the homework numbers. I will I will put them in here. Um, right now, but if you want to know them right now, I can tell you them. We're going to do numbers one and two and four and five and seven. So one, two, four, five, seven, 11, 12, and 15 through 18. So some animations, a couple of uh, things with um, Mandelbrot stuff, a movie or two. So, and that takes us to the end of coding. Um, direct coding, I would say. Chapter fifteen. Is going to be a very different kind of thing. Creating graphical user interfaces, we use, we almost exclusively do that from uh, property inspector windows. Uh, so it's mostly kind of point and click kind of stuff rather than writing code. We still deal a lot with code, but it's in a in some somewhat a different way. It's more like you. Uh, manipulate code and alter code and add code into existing code rather than writing code from scratch. So it's a very different kind of feel, but it's more realistic, I think. Not necessarily more fun, but more realistic. All right, we're done. Have a great day. And we will see you next week. I will get this all put into my math for the chapter 14. Homework.